Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Shutt, episode 392, featuring part two of my interview with the great Chuck Somerville. In this part of the episode, we get into uh, summer games, we talk about winter games, uh, what it was like working at Epix, so we talk about Destroyer, and also uh, Chuck talks about some really cool tricks he worked out on the Commodore 64 uh, to do what was thought impossible on that platform. A lot of great, great stuff here, so without further ado, here is Mr. Chuck Somerville. Yeah, I guess you probably knew Nasser there from I didn't, didn't ever really ask about You him, know, I I never was, actually met Nasser. I'm I'm sorry to say I don't he he didn't come into the office, so I never really met him. I, I've heard a lot about him. Yeah, we were talking about so. Romero before. That's his big hero, right? <laughs> oh yeah, definitely. <laughs> that's that's Romero's big hero. Let's get into these uh what do you call these? I guess the Olympics games, uh, Epics, all these series. Uh, <sighs> yeah, the, the summer game games series. was the first one, right? Um, yeah, Summer Games um, was, I was just doing a port to the Apple. And then uh, the marketing department at Epic said, okay, we got a winner here. Let's, let's keep cranking them through this machine. Mm -hmm. So then they did Winter Games and the Summer Games 2 and Winter Games 2. And then eventually they did California Games. <laughs> <laughs> and that was a little closer to home for you, right? You said you're a skateboarder yourself? Well, I, I yeah, I was a skateboarder. Um, in fact, I wrote the skateboard event in California Games. And uh, it was... Um, the people who were working on that game, they, they're from California, or they were part of the California culture, so they really got kind of this extreme sports things. You know, we would play with with um with the little uh, bags that you bounce off your feet out in the you know the front hacky driveway sack. hacky sack we play hacky sack and you know we, we some of us skied and and some of us surfed and things like that so it was it was a lot more personal um uh, funny story about it though that game um one of the guys that i met um who was originally from lucasfilm kevin furry who eventually ended up becoming my partner. He's my partner now. He and I co-managed that project. And um, he, uh, he was convinced it was going to be a hit, and I was convinced it was going to be just another games game and nobody would care. And so I kind of downplayed the whole thing. I thought it wasn't going to fly. Um, and it was hugely successful, so he likes to always hold that over my head. <laughs> and say, you know, if if Chuck doesn't believe in it, then it's probably a good thing. <laughs> I loved it. I think yeah, even the box looks better, right? I mean, you got that. Oh, yeah. Actually, I think we've got I got this poster here yeah, that we can I mean, show. Looks... Yeah. I, mean, we we always... I don't know if you have a copy of one of the summer games or like the winter games, but they look very, you know, sort of well, plain this... looking compared. Yeah. To this. This well, this like was a... a photo shoot. You know, obviously they worked pretty hard at, you know, getting some talent there. So it's not the guys hanging around epics and the <laughs> oh no. no, I think those are professional models. <laughs> yeah, I think that was one of the things I was watching some of your other other videos, and you were saying that you know epics didn't play around with like the programmer art and all of this sort of. Thing. They sort of had a more professional uh, quality, slick production values. And... They had they had full time art staff, and it was a great thing. And uh, the programmers also wrote tools for the art staff. So not only were we writing games, we were also building tools for the art staff to build uh, build stuff out of both sound and, and art. Did you kind of have a running competition going with Electronic Arts and Trip Hawkins and all that? Actually, I had, friends at, I had friends at Electronic Arts, so I, I can't say I had any competition. Like. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, in fact, um, we had I had friends from all over the industry and and some of us used, used to get together um, up in Livermore, and we did this big haunted house called Hell's Breath. And it was a huge production. We turned this whole house, you know, scenes all over the place, graveyard scenes and an electrocution scene and um, it's all sorts of stuff. And, again, my partner Kevin Furry and I, we were in charge of the, uh, the Frankenstein's lab scene 
and you know we had like a full-on tesla coil <laughs> <laughs> oh wow so uh yeah but you know these were people from all over the game industry got together to do this you know so we were we were friends we did stuff together it must have, you know this is the i remember talking to richard gary and he also was big into the big halloween productions what, what is it about the halloween uh, the haunted houses and all of that is there a connection between that and the games i think it's more of a, a technology thing technology. because ha- halloween is the type of thing you can apply technology to you know, we, we were, you know, setting up sound systems and strobe systems for doing lightning. And, you know, we had LED panels with blinking lights all over them and, you know, sound generators for, you know, making it sound like the uh, electrocution chair was going off. Just all sorts of stuff. <laughs> well, one thing before we move on from these game series, I, I heard you talk about the... Is this luge? Is that how you pronounce this? Luge? <laughs> luge, yeah. I heard luge. you talk about the luge event in Winter Games. And, you know, I guess whereas, you know, growing up in California, yeah, you know all about surfing and skating, but luge, you know. <laughs> so you had to get some, some extra help. Yeah, I was really lucky. Um, we Somebody in our company contacted, I guess, the Olympic Committee, and they found somebody from the, somebody who was actual, you know, a luge athlete to spend some time talking to me, me. and um, the, the tips that I got from, from him was that um, the, uh, the difference in times between a good run and a bad run are very, 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 very close. And um, that what it's really about is carving the correct line down the path. So you want to go into the curves and come out of the curves in, in a way that will minimize your distance and increase your speed. So that's kind of the way I, I set up the luge was um, you would you would know that um, after you played it a number of times, you would memorize the order that all the, the screens were coming at you. So you knew I got a right turn, I got a left turn, I got a U-turn to the right. And if you memorized all of them, you knew which kind of which lane to get into in the previous screen leading up to it. And that was the way you optimized that game. That's how I designed that. Uh, it unfortunately, and it unfortunately may have been a little too realistic because um, in the end it was really, there was really very little difference between a good run and a bad run. So um, yeah, I'd have to say it's authentic. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking about that after listening to, you know, the story, because you'd think that with Olympic game, you want it to be as authentic as possible, right? I mean, why would you buy uh, uh, you also want it to be game? Fun. Yeah, but that, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so what, what kind of lesson is, there must be a lesson in there somewhere for game designers, right? Yeah, I think lessons for lame, for lame, for lame game <laughs> for designers. Lame. <laughs> <laughs> <That's it. laughs> um, I think what I, what I would say, uh, a good lesson is, um, that I wish I had learned very, very early on and I didn't, was that the gameplay is much more important than the presentation. Um, because, you know, I was trying to, to do games that looked really beautiful, um, you know, back on the Apple II and things like that. And, you know, other people were figuring out things like, like Tetris. It was like, oh, you know, this is really simple graphically, but man, what a great game. And man, did it sell a lot. You know, so I wish I had, had really captured that much more early that the the game design is the most important part you know something i didn't realize until you you sent me the notes was uh your connection to ball blazer ah i mean that yeah that game was just really amazing and speaking about great presentations i mean that was uh so um so ball blazer, blazer was originally a lucas uh lucas arts title and it was originally coded for the atari 800 and if you look at the game you can see that it's designed to run on that hardware um it it was kind of custom built for the atari 800 and the the um display display list technology and um so we we were it needed to be ported to the commodore 64 and um, that's, that's the system I, think, I played it on. I have to say, I don't even know if I've seen the Atari version. Now I'm curious. Well, <laughs> I hope that you played my version because there was an early version that was released, uh, done by I think it was done by Kbyte, and it didn't look right. There were also it glitched and it had all sorts of problems. 
and uh, they sent one of my my best program uh, best programs I know, Steve Landrum, to Europe to try to help him fix it, and he couldn't fix it. And then um, my manager, Craig Nelson, said, "I think we can do it here," and he put me on it. And um, so he he made a bet, I think, for a dollar that we could do it right. Um, to and Lucasfilm just flat out said, "Can't be done. It's impossible." But um, Kevin Furry again, here's that name, my, my, part, my current partner. He, he was the programmer at Lucasfilm that was working on it. Um, he, and he, he and I did it together. We actually had to build custom hardware um, to analyze what was going on cycle by cycle in the Commodore 64. Uh, so we built, uh, basically, we built our own um, logic analyzer that captured the, uh, the bus cycle, cycle by cycle, to understand where the time was. And we had to do timing that was so critical that certain stores or certain registers had to happen on specific cycles with respect to the video retrace. Um, so, uh, and I had to do my work in conjunction with, with Kevin Furry, which is known as Fuzzy. Fuzzy. And uh, Fuzzy, yeah. Fuzzy and I became good friends. And uh, the work that I did on Ball Blazer, uh, actually creating that display that his colleagues said was impossible, his colleagues at Lucasfilm said is impossible, convinced him that he really didn't want to work at LucasArts anymore. And he quit LucasArts and came to work full time at Epix, um, which is why he and I co managed the California games. Hmm. So I guess you did win the dollar, really. <laughs> <laughs> well, my, my uh, yeah, my, my manager did. He won that dollar. <clears throat> what about this naval combat simulator game, uh, Destroyer? Uh, Destroyer. Destroyer was a, a game designed by Michael Kasaka. And at the time, he was an artist and was just start at, at Epics. A great artist, actually. Uh, he loved his work. But... Um, he had this idea for a World War II combat simulation based on the destroyers, and he drew up lots of designs for screenshots, and he wanted to build something that was essentially built on the game series technology, like Summer Games, mm -hmm. um, but it was a combat destroyer package. So the different screens in it were like different events, and you had like the radar screen, the sonar screen, and the uh, torpedo screen, or the depth charge screen, damage control, there were various navigation, various screens. So uh, I ended up writing all these events for this thing where you could switch back and forth between the events in mid-mission. Um, but it had a very similar uh, mechanism. Um, to the to the you know loading different events, so you would it would load the different stations up as it went. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we were talking about the luge before and the realism and how that kind of affected it. And I thought this uh, there's a quotation from Computer Gaming World. I guess it was a review of a review of a destroyer. They said it's an excellent naval simulation that doesn't require a vast background in war games. Anyone who has ever played computer games and won at chess. Should should have a ball. <laughs> so it sounds like you might have, uh, you know, learned more about how to make a game fun. And because I can imagine a game like this, you know, if it's focused too much on, you know, being accurate or realistic, so to speak, would quickly get overwhelming for just a, you know, a kid. Well, it, it was it was mostly um, it was mostly Michael Kasaka's great design. I really have to give him credit for that. Um, because you know he was he was playing the games like you know Doctor Mario and things like that, so so he was really into understanding the the gameplay much more than I was at that time. But an interesting thing about uh, Destroyer, um, when I when I looked at how much needed to be done, I uh, I told my manager I said I I can't do it in, in this schedule. There's no way that I can write all this code and properly test it. So you're going to have to hire somebody to help me test it. And as far as I know, that was the first time that Epix actually started using professional testers was for that project. Wow. I might have been the <laughs> among the first in the industry then. <laughs> Could be. Yeah, and mostly because as a programmer, I didn't have time to do everything. So I guess that made a, a really huge difference working with a professional tester. Um, actually... 
he was just a player, a game player, you know, that that got this job. And uh, maybe it re- the thing is, there really wasn't a, a known position as a game tester at the time. This was, you know, so. <laughs> but uh, just but he some guy great. that liked games. Yeah, some guy that wanted to, you know, that said he'd be willing to play games and pay get paid for it. Uh, and he, he was really good. His name was Rolf. Uh, he ended up moving on to Electronic Arts, and I think he worked in their IT department over there for a while. I, when I moved to Electronic Arts, I ran into him again. <laughs> that's all for this week's episode hope you guys enjoyed that Uh, i'm hoping to be back uh next week with uh, part three of this but we'll have to play it by ear Uh, of course a lot of stuff going on uh, as we get closer to the uh, christmas holiday Uh, but i do have a matt chat google hangout or youtube live event whatever you want to call it uh, basically a live uh, streaming chat uh, set up for December 16th at 3 o'clock p.m. at Central Standard Time. Uh, so if you want to chat with me in real time, uh, just look at the, I'll post a link in the show notes to this event. It's also on the Patreon site and the Facebook page. Uh, but basically, uh, anybody can tune in and watch this. If you support the show, uh, then you can be a guest on the program. Uh, sometimes it can be a little bit tricky getting people uh, synced up with that. So if, if you don't want to be a guest, uh, you know, one thing you can do is always just post some comments in the chat stream. Uh, but if you don't want to actually have your video in the, um, as part of the broadcast, uh, send me an email or just let me know somehow, and I'll uh, send you the link uh, when the moment arrives. So uh, just be looking for that. December 16th at 3 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time. Uh, All right, uh, as always, I want to thank you, thank you very, 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 very much for supporting this show. Remember, guys, you are what make this show happen. There are no advertisers. Uh, There's no, uh, you know, big corporate presence here or anything. It's just a group of guys that want to hear more from uh, people like Chuck Somerville. Uh, So if you support the show, I really appreciate that. And uh, uh, I think, uh, you know, I I want to sound humble saying this. I think we're making a contribution to the history uh, not just to video games, but, uh, you know, just history in general. I mean, this is a pretty fascinating time we're going through. You probably don't realize uh, until you really start thinking about the sort of profound changes all this means for society. But, uh, but anyway, this is all in way uh, to say that we've got a bit of a problem uh, over at Patreon right now. Uh, as you know, I'm, a, I'm kind of a big fan of Patreon. I've used them now for, <laughs> I guess, about a at least about uh, three or four years now. And uh, usually what I ask people to do is just, if you like the show, just give me a buck, an episode, you know, about four bucks a month. You know, not trying to get rich off of this, just trying to keep uh, the <laughs> episodes in production. Uh, well, that's been fine until now, uh, because what's happened is that uh, Patreon has changed their fee structure so that instead of this uh, taking a percentage of everything, they're taking that 2.9% uh, fee and on top of that, charging a flat 35 cent uh, fee on top of that. So basically, <laughs> oh boy, here we go. I tried to do some math. And as far as I can tell, uh, the buck uh, ends up being uh, 61 cents by the time you take the 35 cents and the 2.9% service fee. So in other words, a buck a show is, a, is just a 61 cents a show, uh, which isn't really very good. You know, I don't think anybody's very happy with that. People that are support the show, they want to support Matt Chat. They don't want to support Patreon, uh, at least not to that degree. Uh, so there's a couple things you can do. Uh, one would be just to add 35 cents on. I don't know how you feel about that. Uh, what I found was that if you if you can increase your pledge to two dollars or three dollars or maybe five dollars, uh, just it does this. It's not really that much more money but it's a lot better percentage. So for example, three bucks, uh, I get $2.56 from that, or 85%. You go up to $5, I get 90%. Uh, so you can see how you know just a few more dollars is a lot better percentage. It uh, really makes a bigger difference. So I'll just say if you can afford a couple dollars more, it's not a big deal to you, just go ahead and do that. Uh, otherwise, uh, there's another solution. This was posted by Jochum. Uh, he came up with this. He's talking about it on the uh, Facebook site. Uh, he says, you, what he does, he adds up the typical month's amount of pledges into just one pledge, 
and then sets a one pledge per month limit. So he just pays the fees one time. Uh, so that, that's pretty clever, I thought. So if you do want, you know, a buck a show, that's about three or four bucks a month. And so you could just tell Patreon that you're giving four dollars, a four dollar pledge, but then set that monthly cap to, to four bucks. So it's, it's a little bit of a cumbersome, maybe, uh, but I guess it works. Uh, the only problem with that, from my perspective, is that it looks like I might be getting a lot more money coming in than I'm actually getting. So I could end up being screwed if I say hire a transcriber to transcribe episodes and uh, not end up, end up with not having enough money to pay her, <laughs> uh, pay him or her for the transcription. So that would that would stink. So I'm not really too thrilled about that solution, but it is a possibility. Uh, other people said uh, they've contacted me and said that they're just going to give me a lump sum. So they just uh, add up the yearly uh, what their pledges would be worth per year and then just make a payment on PayPal. Uh, you can do that over matchat.us if you like. Uh, and I'm not really sure how I feel about all this. I'm not really too happy with any of these solutions. I, I really just wish that Patreon would have stuck with their old old way of doing things. And they, they might still change this. I don't know how. Uh, they seem like they've caught, caught a lot of flack about it. So uh, I know some of you guys have your own YouTube channels and you're uh, raising uh, money with Patreon. Uh, maybe you know about some other service, but anyway, I just really like to hear your thoughts, your suggestions on this, because uh, it's really kind of a big deal, not just for me, but for you know anybody trying to do work like this and fund it through something like Patreon. So, anyway, sorry if that bored you, but I wanted to do well, let you know, especially if you were a, a paying a supporter of the show, uh, what's sort of going on behind the scenes here, and, and also. Uh, See if you guys can help me out, either with uh, <laughs> a bigger pledge or uh, better ideas as to how to fund the show. Okay, moving on. Uh, thanks to Lars, uh, we are set to interview Leonard Bajarski on Tuesday, just a couple days away. Now, if you don't know who Leonard is, he's uh, done a lot of work for Interplay, Troika, <laughs> Blizzard, and <laughs> Obsidian. Uh, wow, you know, this is going to be jam-packed. Uh, he's done work on Fallout, uh, just... Countless projects he did work on Stonekeep. Uh, in a lot of the shows, uh, games I've covered on the show, he's actually uh, been part of those developments, uh, those projects. So anyway, I'm really excited about this. I've already gotten quite a few suggestions for questions from you guys. Uh, if you want to, uh, you know, contribute some questions or some ideas for topics, uh, you can do that on the video or the Facebook page or whatever. And I'll post a link in the uh, show notes to the Wikipedia page just in case you want to read up on Leonard, uh, because uh, I want to make sure that we cover a, a broad spectrum, you know, not just all the questions about one thing. You know, I kind of like to get in a variety of stuff, so I'll be doing that. Uh, in other news, uh, <laughs> over on Indie Retro Gaming, they're talking about this new Amiga platform game. That's right, you heard it right, a new Amiga platformer. This is called The Dream of Rowan. Uh, the pre-orders are available at special Christmas prices, so you might want to get those in if you're interested. It's 17.90 euros, which, uh, according to my calculations, are about 20 bucks U.S. cash. Uh, they got a demo you can check out too. Uh, but anyway, I think it'd be worth the 20 just to hear this music. Really great music. It remind it just this game reminds me just you know if you told me this game was from 1988 or whatever, and it would just fit right in there with my. Uh, Amiga platforming favorites, I would believe it. Uh, it really seems true to that spirit. Uh, and Stig wrote in about this. Uh, this is called Unavowed. It's the latest point-and-click adventure from Wadget Eye Games. Remember them? I had them on the show not too long ago. Uh, in this one, you get to play as a guy or a gal. You have three playable origin stories, branching storyline, four companion characters, uh, each with their own talents and abilities, and it's twice the resolution of the typical uh, Wadget Eye game. I don't know, what, what are those, like 640 by 480? So that's pretty exciting. Uh, in this one, it's about a demon possession forcing you to tear a trail of bloodshed through, the New York, through New York City. Your salvation comes in the form of the unavowed, an ancient society dedicated to stopping evil. Uh, so this looks and sounds uh, fantastic. I know a lot of you guys and, uh, and gals are, are big fans of the point and clicks. Uh, so here you go. Go check out Unavowed. Um, I know it's going to be great. Let's see. Fourth bit of news. Well, I'm feeling like a news anchor or something up here, you know. <laughs> uh, Matt the Anchorman. 
Uh, anyway, uh, Adam Dayton, a longtime uh, friend of the show, uh, his his uh, group has interviewed Julian Gollop, uh, the XCOM guy, uh, now of Snapshot Games, and that's on their Fragments of Silicon podcast. Always worth a listen. No, you, probably a lot of you uh, guys are already subscribed, but just in case, I'll mention that because you definitely don't want to miss the episode with uh, Julian Gollop, <laughs> and that'd just be crazy. Uh, and you can and you can listen to it on YouTube if you like. And I'm gonna I'm just gonna post the link to the YouTube channel, uh, but I'm sure from there you can get to the uh, you know whatever that service is they use to stream that if you would rather uh, listen to it on your uh, device. All right, this is a. a <laughs> <laughs> bit of a fan or friend news, whatever you want to call it. Uh, this is Matt Chat's youngest fan. It's a, it's a half, <laughs> it's a kid named Anthony. He's half a year old, and a look at him. He's already on his way to becoming a retro gaming rat boy. Uh, so I think he's uh, worthy of a big wedge of cheese. Look, he's, <laughs> you know, he's uh, quite entertained there by the uh, the Matt Chat. So I really love that kind of stuff. Uh, if, if you if you have little fun photos you want to send in to Matt Chat, uh, please do so. I'll put them on the on the show. All right, I think that will do it. I uh, just want to remind you one uh, last time. Uh, don't forget about December sixteenth at three o'clock Central Standard Time. We'll be doing the Google Air Hangout. Hope to see you there. Uh, if you don't want to stream your video or audio, that's fine. You can always just listen and maybe uh, post some comments in the chat stream. A lot of people like to do that, a little shy. <laughs> you know, they don't want to do the whole camera thing. Look, that's fine. Uh, but I'd still like to hear from you, still like to chat with you. So uh, December 16th at 3 o'clock p.m. All right, let's wrap it up with a uh, quotation. And I was looking uh, for quotes about progress, and I came across this one by... George Bernard Shaw, and it sounds like kind of a simple thought, uh, but the more you kind of process it, the, really the sort of more profound it gets. I mean, I'm still just kind of I'll wrap my head around this, but anyway, uh, let's see what you can do with it. It goes something like this. Progress is impossible without change, and those who cannot change their minds cannot change anything. So ponder on that and see you guys next time. Which only goes to show that even the fearsome Frankenstein has a 100% red-blooded American sense of humor. <laughs>